Hello there and welcome to the English Language Club. It's a Tuesday, so it's time for our weekly hangout. Uh, sorry to be a little bit late. We had a couple of uh, slight uh, technical issues. Uh, we so, But yes, we're here now. That's the important thing. I uh, hope you're all doing very well. Um, we've not got any questions yet, so get those some questions coming in. I can see we do have a few people watching, which is great. Uh, so yeah, let us know if you've got any questions, anything about learning English. Um, it can be specific, it can be general. Um, or uh, just let us know how you're enjoying your your Christmas holiday period, uh, if you if you're on if you're already celebrating. Uh, Tony, how are you doing? Are you enjoying Christmas? Uh, actually, uh, yes, I've really been enjoying uh, the Christmas season so far this year. I remember that last week we talked about uh, how many people have decorations up, and even more people have decorations up in in our neighborhood than than the last time we talked. The uh, there's a, a neighborhood right across the street from us, and there are probably uh, like three quarters of the houses probably have have decorations of some sort up, and and there's a lot of houses that have a ton of decorations up. So it's really getting uh, people are are going all out this year. Mm, that's great. Um, I don't think there's been much of a change for, in that sort of area uh, here in the UK, or at least in my neighbourhood. I'm sure. I'm sure a lot more people have decorations up. Um, as you can see, I don't have any decorations up really. Um, it's just me here, so uh, I I I never I don't I don't normally bother too much. Um, plus, I'm out I'm out working most of the time, especially at Christmas. Um, but hopefully, in the coming year. That's going to change uh, as as we will hopefully be doing more and more things with English Language Club, and hopefully yeah. we'll be able to go full time on it. Um, but anyway, I suppose uh, we can get more about that later. Um, now, so yeah, we are still waiting for some questions. We've got a few people watching. AJ is with us. AJ, uh, one of our regular viewers, mm -hmm. always is always there. So you're very welcome. Uh, number one is there he's another regular he says hello hope you're both fine uh yeah and uh, also sama Samar, samaran samaran nahar may peace be upon you thank you very much um and um yeah we had some technical issues i think you may have been watching on the other the stream yes. the other stream which went went wrong um, we're really proper now that's right yeah and we, amelia aguilar from uh, panama city uh teacher in Panama City, welcome back. We talked to you last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And AJ's got a question. This is not really for us, but I think for everyone, or not specifically for us, but everyone. Uh, so, classic Christmas films that are good for that are good to learn English. So, yeah, if you have any favorite Christmas films that you think people should watch because it might help them with English, um, then yeah, let us know what your favorite Christmas movies are. That would be great to uh, to to hear those recommendations. Do you have any famous uh, favorite Christmas movies, Tony? Oh man, um, uh, I'm quite fond of uh, some of the really classic ones. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, great movie. Um, some great performances uh, in there. Uh, I wouldn't recommend The Grinch, any of the multitude of Grinch movies that are out there, because uh, they don't use they use a lot of made up words in that. But then again. Uh, those books were originally written mm. for for um, children, uh, so I don't know. Maybe they're actually really great. Yeah, uh, for for helping you practice your English. I'm not sure. Uh, very. There's some of the. Well, I think some of those some of those made up words though. Some of those made up words, perhaps not in the movies, but in the books. In the although books. they're made up words, they they do kind of teach um, the kind of word formation, the laws of word, word formation, the rules of word formation, and things like that. I think it's because even though it's a made-up word, you can see exactly. whether it's a, a verb or a noun. Mm. Right, they're very easy to read, and so when you're you because I've read with uh, with kids um, a lot, and so when you are reading with a very small child, you're reading a Dr. Seuss book because Dr. Seuss is the person who originally wrote the How the Grinch Stole Christmas book, and then there's been many movies that have been made of it. Uh, but uh, when you're reading it, the the words are really easy to read. They they are sometimes hard for adults to read mm. because they're so weird, but like they just roll right off the tongue. They're very easy to pronounce. They're very easy to say. And so they really help uh, young children practice their reading. I'm not sure whether that yeah. transfers across to listening, uh, uh, but they are very interesting. Yeah. And they're mm. just fun movies. When I, uh, when I was doing more one-on-one uh, -on -one teaching, I did used to give 
Dr. Zeus books to my students to mm -hmm. and to, to read out loud to help to with the pronunciation. Loud. Exactly. Uh, and not 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 children. I mean, adult adult learners. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah, for sure. Yeah, because yeah. they're designed for yeah. people who are, are still learning to read. Right. Um, mm. yeah. yeah. Dr. Seuss books are, are really great. And yeah, uh, again, not sure how how helpful the movies are, but the books are, are really, really useful to practice how English sounds and how English works. Yeah. Have you ever mm. seen that? Have you, they have yeah. there's videos floating around. Uh, Colin, have you seen them of uh, English? without meaning like people are speaking grammatically correct english sentences by using nonsense words uh to help give the the, um, the idea is yes. to understand what english sounds like if you're not a if you're already a native speaker what does it sound like to other people yeah yeah, yeah in fact somebody was um, mentioning there's a song there's a whole song that's written uh and all the lyrics are not are, are made up words that that don't really exist that's interesting um and I, someone, somebody was talking about that the other day. So yes, I have heard that, and I have seen videos um, yeah. like that. In fact, I think I saw a video that was had like English, French, and German, but all made up words. Right. But, um, Interesting. That, yeah. yeah. For there, that there's, there's an old tradition of it. I mean, I one of my favorite poems is uh, "Jabberwock" by Lewis Carroll, which is all full of made up words, uh, but it all makes sense. You can kind of tell which words are the verb and which words are the nouns, and you can understand mm. the story even though it mostly uses made up words. Yeah. yeah. Does it but, does it sort of phase them in, and, and so by the end, it's like completely yeah. made up words, but you understand it because that would no. be an interesting. Well, do. I mean, it, it doesn't tell you what the words mean. I mean, in, in the story, uh, they introduce what some of the words mean. Um, so brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, but they, you don't know that when you're reading the poem. It just uses the word brillig uh, and so on. Yeah. Mm. It still uses words like and and to and he and stuff like that. But all the, all the real beefy nouns and adjectives and stuff are all made up. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, back to back to Christmas movies. We've only yes. got one one person recommend Home Alone two. For a, a, AJ says that as well, uh, which is I think a strange choice. I think Home Alone, the original Home Alone, is a lot better than Home Alone two, right? Uh, yeah. Home Alone, yeah, <laughs> Home Alone one is definitely a Christmas movie. Is Home Alone two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think so. I think so because I think it's like the next year, isn't it, or two years later or something? You know, I don't, I don't remember. remember. I don't remember. <laughs> Home Alone one. Is I don't, I'm not even sure if I've seen Home Alone two, maybe, so maybe I shouldn't judge it. But anyway, Home Alone 2, good recommendation. Um, I always think of uh, Die Hard when people ask Die me Hard. Um, yeah. Christmas movies. The original Die Hard, yeah. Yeah, although the story is not really anything to do with Christmas, it is uh, set during Christmas because there's like office Christmas parties and things. And I think that's the reason that the office building that they're in is very is empty. Right, because except there's people in it for the Christmas party. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah there's people yeah. there. So, well, I mean, yeah. and that's important that, like, you know, the, the themes of that movie, that it's all about family and the lengths we go to to be with our family for Christmas. Um, yeah. <laughs> so he, he happens to crawl across broken glass and things like that. Uh, but uh, it's all about, and it's about, like, when, you know, the some of it is classes. Like, his, his wife is attending a Christmas party and the police officer is working Christmas Eve night right like so yeah, it's a very it's a very christmas movie i think uh in in a lot of ways it's just not your typical feel-good christmas movie uh, yeah but yeah. it's a very good movie yeah that's a good recommendation yeah, yeah. great uh, and then okay. there's, there's movies uh that are there's the like the animated movies from from like the 60s 70s or whatever um like uh rudolph the red-nosed reindeer um uh jack frost uh Frost and the Snowman, uh, the original uh, how, uh, how the Grinch Stole Christmas, uh, that are all relatively short, uh, and they are were originally intended for children, but they have fun little stories to them too. So those those could be very interesting to, to watch. Mm. And there was a movie um, that a couple, few years ago it was a Tom Hanks, but it was animated, uh, which is based on a very famous Christmas book. Uh, um, about a train, uh, the something express, Chris, uh, Polar Express, Polar Express. Yeah, that was really good. I like, I like that. I didn't, yeah, it didn't um, do too well I, here because Polar Express is what we call really, really nasty cold winter. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, but it is also it's a famous book, right? It is a famous children's book. Yeah, it, I think it's book. it's it's very famous in America, but it's not so famous outside of America. I don't think. Um, but yeah, the film was the film was great. Uh, great. Anyway, we've got some uh, 
English related questions now. So, but yeah. anyway, keep your Christmas favorite Christmas movies recommendations coming in because it will be Definitely. good to, to hear them. Uh, so, let's see. Um, Samaran says, um, I have a problem in listening to English. Sorry to say that, that uh, but for this problem of mine, I can't understand the native English speakers clearly. Can you please tell me a way of improving listening? Hmm. So, well, I mean, it does matter whether we're talking about in person or if we're talking about trying to listen to movies or television, don't you think? Yes, and if and, and again, if you're watching the news or something like that, so I would think something watching the news should be easier, um, and then watching movies again would be uh, again e a little bit easier than listening to two native speakers having a conversation, um, but especially the if they. You have the advantage of if you're Don't. talking to someone in person, you can say, could you slow down? I'm having trouble understanding yeah. you, right? And most people will if, do that. If you're trouble. one of the two people in the conversation, but if the, yeah. if it's two other people and you're trying to follow it, then that's very, that's, I would say, is the most difficult. That is um, very difficult. Is very but yeah, difficult. so is, are there any, are there any ways to improve the listening? I guess it just takes well, practice and I, I guess a good a good way would be to start something like the news. BBC uh, news BBC is Britain. is they always try to keep the English relatively simple uh, compared to other things. So that's a good place to to start. Um, um, any other tips, Tony? So you know, you're talking about like the, some of the easiest ways to practice are with uh, television or or movies. Uh, tele or the news especially, and that's great. And one thing that I can say is a unique advantage when you're watching something like that is you can often adjust the speed. If you download a video mm. and then you find a player, if your player, you're, I mean, on YouTube or something like that, you can adjust the speed, yeah. right? If you are downloading something, find a player that lets you adjust the speed if your video player doesn't. And then you can, you can slow it way down. And you can also usually turn on captions like the news or something like that is always going to have captions subtitles right and if you're look if you're watching a movie or television show if it's something you know it's not something really obscure you can probably find subtitles or captions for it right so mm -hmm. um, that's great you slow it right down and turn the captions on like if you're if you're that's the absolute like you know if you're really really struggling you know turn it to half speed turn the captions on and you can also rewind right so a lot of uh, players nowadays have like a, or even YouTube has like a back 10 seconds or back five seconds button. And so oftentimes yeah. when I'm watching something in a, in a language I don't know, or even if they just have a really strong accent or something and you miss a detail, you just ch ch click a couple times back and listen to it again. And you can do it as many times as you can if you get, or as many times as you want, if you get a word that you don't know, right? Mm. Or a phrase and you're like, I don't understand that. And then if you're like Susanta, you write it down and you come ask us what it means. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a, yeah, that's always a good thing to do. Look at all these um, two questions. This is going to be fun. Now, I think you can even get um, uh, subtitles on live streams, uh, of, but obviously it's done by by computer, so it's not always yeah. accurate. So perfect, uh, yeah. um, I'm not sure if it would be possible on this live stream because um, because of the setting, but I'm thinking. We might change that so that it is possible. It would be it would just mean that there's a longer delay um, uh, between when we speak and when you actually hear us. So then, when you reply in the comments, it's some, it could might just be it might be a very long time after. But yeah, that that probably have, to have subtitles might might be a, a, a good trade off. Um, yes. Okay. Let's see. Um, there was just a so, question Amar, related to this you were just asking about um, if we could just hit that real quick while we're on the same topic uh, from English with Heidi. Yeah, I think the dialogues. I think the dialogues of native speaker will, speakers would be much more helpful than news, as I think the news readers read in in a printed manner. Is that is that way? Isn't it, Isn't that, it way? that way? Yes, so I will say this is one thing um, that is very, very, uh, it's hard to notice. No dialogue that you hear on television, news, uh, movies is realistic. 
It's not the way people actually talk mm -hmm. when they talk to each other. It's written, designed, but it's designed to be more engaging and easier to follow. Okay, so you're not yeah. like watching a movie or something like that. And, and honestly, watching you know dialogues that are specifically designed for ESL people aren't much better. Like again, that's not how people talk, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, obviously the best thing is if you can have you know one on one or small group conversations with native speakers that's interactive, where you're listening to them but you're also talking to them, right? Because that's the best way to practice a language because that's how languages actually work. Language isn't designed for you to listen in on other people. It's designed for you to communicate. Uh, that said, if you don't have access to that, I really do think that the news is one of the best ways um, to practice your listening skills, not to practice your you know, conversation skills, but your listening skills. Because of all of those different things, it's the best combination of realistic and designed to be easy to understand. Now, you have to, you have to be careful which news you're watching right? Uh, BBC is known for um, the fact that they're trying to reach such a large audience means that they work very hard to keep their uh, their reports within certain levels of English ability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good point, but it's actually a lot trickier than it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reason I mentioned um, news is because, yeah, yes, the ultimate goal is to be able to understand, come to a native, and, uh, uh, come to the UK or America and be able to have a conversation with anyone or yeah. be able to understand what two people are saying. Um, um, but, you know, as a, if, if that is difficult, then a, a good step towards that would be yes. um, you, you know, watching, watching news and things. Absolutely. Yeah. These are all steps, right? Like these are all different tools. Some people, if you tell them, Hey, you should go practice your alphabet. They'll be like, well, I know my alphabet. I'm way past that. I'm trying to write university papers in English. Like, okay, you're at a different level, right? So definitely uh, depends on where you're at. BBC is a great place to start. Um, if you can understand English, but you're struggling with your listening skills and you want to improve, uh, there you might find other, other things. Last week, we or maybe it was two weeks ago, we talked a lot about finding an online community to be a part of a Discord channel for your favorite game or that talks about your favorite sporting event or something. And and actually being able to go on and and listen to the conversation and engage in it. But for some people, that's gonna to be too hard to just jump yes. in there, right? And so there's the different levels that you can use to, now, to practice. Speaking of Discord, um, I wasn't sure, I wasn't gonna mention it this week, but as you've, as you've mentioned Discord, um, if we, I'm considering starting a Discord for the English Language Club. Uh, so if, can you just let me know in the chat, just ha have it as a quick kind of, um, poll to see who, who know, uh, it, it, just let us know if you use discord or, uh, if you would, if you would, if you, if we did start a discord, would you, would you sign up? Um, yeah, just, just let us know what your, what your thoughts are. Would you like us to start a discord? That would be really useful to know. Um, and, um, yeah, so um, so for those of you who don't know, Discord is a website where you can go to sort of start private chat rooms, um, and you can, um, you know, so then we could ask each other questions. We could have questions coming in during the week. Um, last week we had a couple of people in the chat um, who realised they were in the same city and they were sort of having a conversation um, separate from the from the. The live stream which is great i, yeah, I really would, would love it i'd love it for people to be able to meet up with each other if they if they find out they're in the same the same city um it's just that and, and things like that because people are always looking for people to have conversations with and 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 to to practice with um so it'd be great if we can facilitate that but um doing it in the live stream it was a little distracting so having the discord as well would May, may be a really good way of doing it um just trying to figure out how how we how we will structure it um but uh yeah let us know if that would be of interest to you um okay so we've got another, a question here from amala aguilar who says i'm taking a master's degree and i have to present a case study about learning assessments where can i find an example so learning assessments well, I mean, there are lots of sort of international exams like the IELTS and the um, 
FCE, the, Cam the Cambridge exams, FCE, uh, uh, CAE, and then um, P, the proficiency. Um, so you and you could very easily Google the e examples and previous uh, examples of previous questions and the types of exercises they're asked that, 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 that are in those exams. So those would be a form of uh, learning assessment. But learning assessments are very broad uh, term. It depends really specifically what you mean. Um, you, do you have any thoughts on that, Tony? So if you're if you're talking specifically about at a master's level, uh, one thing that I would maybe suggest is look up some Canadian or American or British, uh, whatever your kind of target is, universities, and find their um, their master's of education program online and look and see if you can find some materials from some of their courses because oftentimes there will, especially nowadays. Right, uh, right now, lots of universities have all their stuff available online. Uh, they'll have their syllabi, or they'll have some some course materials. Right, so you know, look up a, a university that you like, or, or or just you know, kind of Google search different uh, um, masters of education programs about pedagogy, about um, K learning assessments, and you might be able to find something. Uh, just because. This is the kind of thing that's being done in, in master's programs or even bachelor's programs all over the English speaking world. Uh, you know, anybody who's studying education is having to write learning assessments uh, and present case studies and stuff like that. So there are a lot of examples. Uh, I can't think of one like off the top of my head that would help you, but there are loads on Google for sure. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, D I would definitely think Google's a, a, a better will be a great way to to find uh, what you're looking for there um because you'll be yeah. able to delve in deeper to specifically the, exactly. the type of assessment um, look, you look for universities materials that's from a university website and it's just more likely to be useful to you yeah, mm. yeah. great so quick follow-up from um quick follow-up from uh samaran uh who's uh relating to the first question we had he says uh i've i've improved uh little in my listening skills this year I'm happy for that, uh, but I couldn't improve uh, my listening fully, but I'm trying. So that's great. I mean, things things take time. Um, and, you know, the fact that you can see that you've made progress in the last year, that's the important thing. Um, yeah. Don't be – you shouldn't be discouraged that things aren't going as, you know, especially if you're comparing yourself to other people and things. Everyone goes at their own pace, and that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah. So – yeah, keep trying, and it's Definitely. great that you can see that you've made progress. Um, and yeah, just just keep at it. Sometimes it feels like I can't. There's there's sort of a famous quote, something along the lines of like, uh, we we make hardly any progress, or we we we. Like, it seems like we make very little progress in in a sh in when we when we look back over a short amount of time, but when we look back over a longer period of time, is we've made. A huge amount of more than we can more than we can believe. So, Absolutely. Um, like think yeah, of it when you're walking it. along so, a path. That's what I would say. When you're when you're walking along a path Great, so, on a mountain and you're climbing up, you can easily look down and see how far you can you've come because you can see everything. But when you're walking along a flat plain and you look back, sometimes you know it doesn't look like you've come very far. But then once you get get some elevation and you can see how far you've come, right? Uh, so yeah, but yeah, everything is about making meaningful steps. So as long as you're improving, that that is great. That is great. Um, I did want to point out one thing. Uh, sometimes people ask us uh, to, you know, to be, to correct anything that they're saying in the, in chat so we can help people learn. So one thing in English, yes. saying I did something little, like I did little, means you did not do very much. A little mm. means you did improve. So, so saying I improved little, Basically, you're saying I didn't really improve. Whereas if you said I improved a little, you're saying, oh, yeah, you did improve, right? Uh, yeah, so I think in your sentence that you're trying to say, I have improved a little in my listening skills. Great, great. Um, yeah. 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 So we know that you're you're saying that because it says, you, you then say, I'm happy for that. Yeah, so exactly. definitely it should be, I, I have improved a little. You're, you're highlighting the fact that that's good. That's a good thing. You're not saying... If you if you wanted to say that it was less than you wanted, or you 
you know, uh, far expected, you wanted to emphasize that, then you say, oh, I've improved little, and that's that would be more negative. Yeah. But to say, I am, to make it more positive and more optimistic, and the fact that you're happy about it, you say, I've improved, I have improved a little. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great, great uh, point. Yeah. I think Good we should... Um, Go ahead. I think we should do that more, um, pointing out, point out people's mistakes in, in the questions once we've answered the question. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Anyway, we've got, um, uh, as, as always, now we've got a few questions from Susanta. So let's get into those. Um, here we go. Right. Yes. First one is, uh, what does make rotation mean? Um, now, well, rotation is means something going round. Oh, so make is this a scientific oh. term? Because you, you mean can't... Make, make a rotation? Because mm. make a rotation is the time it takes to go around one time. So like the Earth makes a rotation in one day, or makes a rotation around the sun in one year. Um, if it's just so that's 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 the only thing I can think of. I can't think of anything that just the phrase make rotation means. But make a rotation. Yeah, is the time it takes to go around once. And this is lots of things. So, you know, um, the seasons make a rotation, right? Or you could talk about uh, the water cycle makes a rotation. Anything that 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 either literally goes around or that is a cycle where things come back to their start. Um, like, you know, an election cycle isn't literally round, but it's, it's something that uh, happens regularly, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I hopefully that's helpful, uh, Susanta. Let us know if that was what you were getting at with that. Uh, then there's some more here. Uh, let me see. Um, so what does until the cookie crumbles mean? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is a common idiom. Uh, what is until, until the cookie crumbles? What well, does that mean? so I'm okay. So this one is, I'm a little, all right. The, the the actual idiom is that's the way the cookie crumbles um mm, and it means yeah. when bad things happen that's just how it works right you're holding a cookie and it collapses it crumbles right you're like that bad things just happen sometimes um so that's yeah. the way the cookie crumbles means you know bad things just happen sometimes i have heard this until the cookie crumbles and i think what it means is like because we know bad things happen sometimes we're just waiting for the bad thing to happen like Nothing's bad. Nothing bad has happened yet, but we know it's going to. So things are fine until the cookie crumbles. Mm. So the cookie crumbling is a is a idiomatic expression which means something bad happening. Yes, um, I think so. Yeah, great. Yeah. Jumping back to to Susanta's question, she just had about the rotation. She, uh, she said uh, later on it was yeah, about it, sports. It was about sports. They said uh, they said we need to make a rotation. So still, it is a rotation. I don't think it, you would say make rotation. I think you still make a rotation. And that means you take yeah. players off the field and put a new player on, right? Yeah, or it could mean some moving players around the field in a certain way. Yes, true. Yeah. Maybe. But um, either way, I think it's a rotation. Let us know um, if you're sure it was just not not a. Uh, there wasn't the word uh. I guess the unless word, it's uh, referring to making the ball rotate by kicking it in a certain way, then I guess it. But then it That's could true. be make rotation, maybe. It's not. I don't think um, it's idiomatic though. There, like you, to, you could say. Yeah, I'm yeah. Then it's literal. Like mm -hmm. you know, if you take something and you spin it, and you're like, hey, I'm making a rotation. But it's a kind of an awkward way to say that. You're you would say you're rotating. Right or like uh, uh, you know, I'm making it spin. Saying I'm making rotation seems a little bit odd. That's like saying I'm making motion. It just isn't something you would normally say. That doesn't mean that someone couldn't say it, but it's not an idiom. The way make a rotation is is idiomatic. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Okay, we've got lots of uh, lots of questions from Suzanne. So let's uh, move on. Um, okay. Is it possible to move the deadline? Now, this. Um, I mean, the word deadline means the the time by which you need to finish something. So yeah. perhaps you have an essay to write. The deadline is the date and time that you need to have finished it by. Uh, so to move the deadline, I guess you're not a deadline is not a physical thing. So you don't literally move it, but you can move it in time. So uh, 
uh, and we use that deadline for issue. time, right? Like if we're saying, like, mm -hmm. uh, can we move our appointment or can we move the party to Tuesday or something like that? Yeah. 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 And so you can move a deadline either forward, making it earlier or back uh, to make it later. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. Um, over the edge. What does over the edge mean? Another question from Susanta. Ooh, this one is interesting. Um, yeah, I'll so leave this one for you. <laughs> well, over the edge, over the edge has a number of of slightly connected meanings. Um, rather than going into it too much, it means like you've passed some natural barrier, right? Like imagine a cliff. Uh, there's a related um, sentence that uh, uh, they went off a cliff, right? Uh, so, for instance, there's there's natural barriers, and you went past that. An example would be you're having a conversation about something slightly uh, um, controversial. And you know some people might be upset about it, but it's okay. You're having a polite conversation, and then someone, then like two people in the conversation, get really upset, and they just start fighting over it and using all kinds of crazy examples. You might say, "This conversation went off a cliff," or "This conversation went over the edge." There was a natural boundary between discussing something and fighting over it, and the and it, you've passed that. Um, uh, that natural boundary. People often use this phrase when they're talking about climate change. Like we're over the edge. You know, they'll say like we, you know, mm. we we things are are already past a point where we like could do something about it. Some people say right. Like you you hear this this phrase and a lot of similar connected phrases to refer to something is past some kind of a a, a boundary that makes sense. A deadline. Opposed, well, no. See, over the line, like would be like something that is not mm. not a natural boundary, something that someone has set and decided. So a deadline is a is a boundary that someone has set, whereas over the edge means it's kind yeah. of a natural boundary. Like a cliff edge is a natural boundary. People normally don't walk off mm. cliffs, but sometimes they do when they're like not paying attention or or uh, out of control. So uh, there's often a connection with over the edge to things being out of control. Like you know you might be in yeah. control while you're walking, the moment you fall off a cliff. You're not in control anymore. It's a really interesting idiom. Yeah. Um, and to push mm -hmm. someone over the edge is to take someone, because uh, Kadia Taylor asked this question, um, to push someone over the edge means you make them pass that boundary. So if someone is talking about something controversial and you say something that you know is going to get them really upset, and then they you know, pass out of conversation and into fighting, um, you've pushed them over the edge. Right, and same going back to the like environmental uh, analogy, you know, when things are are bad, and then you do something to make them worse. Sometimes you push them over the edge into uh, like the realm where you no longer can fix it. Right, that's a good mm -hmm. follow up question there, Kadia. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, another one from Susanta, who says, uh, "What?" does it mean when you say yes or no at the beginning of a sentence um well you would often say yes or no at the beginning of a sentence if you're answering a question um mm. do you like cheese yes my favorite is well, cheddar so she put the quotes around it is she saying mm. when you actually say yes or no uh, so if someone said, ah. do you like cheese? Yes or no. It depends on the kind of cheese. I think yes and no is more common than yes or no. Um, mm. But oftentimes you'll hear this. Someone says, yeah, do you like do you like pop? Well, yes and no. I like root beer, but no other kinds of pop. Um, <laughs> or uh, do you, uh, uh, yeah, lots of different things. Um, so, yeah, it just means that the answer is more complicated than a simple yes or no. Uh, then ironically, we communicate that by saying yes or no or yes and no um mm. because the answer we're saying yeah the answer is more complicated than that now you might also say um yes or no when you want to specify when you're mm. asking a question that you want the uh, person to answer either okay. yes or no and not be vague and not really answer the question so it's like uh you know uh, yes or no are you coming to the party um, but don't say, oh, well, maybe if my mother's not uh, not able to look after my children or whatever, you know, if you want a clear answer, you can say yes or no, then answer the ask, ask the question. That's another time you might hear that. Uh, but um, yeah. OK, there was a 
a couple more. Um, let's see who blinks first means what? Oh, this is fun. Uh, so sometimes um, people, especially kids, will do what's called a staring contest, which is where they'll look at each other and they'll try really hard not to blink. And whoever blinks <laughs> first loses. And so I this I is... <laughs> I wasn't looking. <laughs> um, so... Uh, the idea is, first of all, it's sort of childish, but it's this idea of like you're pitting your wills against your will against someone else's will, and whoever caves, whoever gives in first, uh, loses. Uh, and it's seen as somewhat childish, somewhat foolish. Um, and so usually when people talk about this kind of thing, they're not they're not particularly. Uh, it's not a positive thing that's happening. You'll also hear people say playing chicken, which means the same mm -hmm. thing, except that yeah. it refers to a really foolish game where people drive their cars or, or vehicles towards each other and see who veers out of the way. Oh, they Last. could be running or walking or pushing I supermarket suppose, trolleys. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's, but it's, it's, so it's, a uh, it's an expression which can metaphorically be used to in talking about negotiations. If it's if uh, referring to that psychological element of, you know, if, yes. um, yeah, to, you know, to see who blinks, who, who gives yeah. in, uh, in to, in a negotiation. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Next. Next one. Um, what's hit in the pocket? So pockets are often used in metaphorically to talk about money because that's where we put money. Um, so when you get when you're hit in the pocket, it means it's going to cost you financially. Um, so if you're, you, you could be talking about a, a, a government project or something, and if it's going to be very expensive, you might say, oh, it's going to hit the taxpayer in the pocket. Um, meaning it's going to, they're going to have to reach into their pocket to get money out. Uh, well, yes. not literally, uh, it'll go through taxes in that case, but you know, that's because that's where we keep money that uh, pockets are often used metaphorically to talk about money. Right. Or you'll hear pocketbook hit in the pocketbook. Same thing, meaning like wallet or purse or whatever. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. So you might you might hear also saying that's going to hit you in the wallet as well, right. or hit um, you in the checkbook, <laughs> which is <laughs> less common nowadays, but it used to be very common. Yeah, really. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think there's different different expressions in in the US and the UK, but um, I'm yeah. sure. No, I mean hit the pocket, pocketbook, uh, wallet. Those are all definitely um, still used here as well. Used to hear it in the checkbook, but that that that's been a while. Yeah, uh, I think this is the last one for now from Susanta. Um, Good questions. Oh, that not that one. Next one. Uh, one before that. Uh, what does something decreasing year on year mean? So year on year is a measure of you're comparing right now to the same time of year last year right? Or during previous years. So just, you're not saying I'm comparing that something all of this year to all of last year. You're saying how were things this time last year compared to this time uh, now, uh, just because naturally things have peaks and troughs. So for instance, if you're selling yeah. Christmas, Christmas cards and uh, you're, it's only, you're only up to July, well, you've probably sold less than half as many Christmas cards as you did last year because you mostly sell your Christmas cards closer to Christmas, right? So by comparing year on year, mm -hmm. you can compare where you are at this part in the natural yearly cycle to where you were last year during the same part in the cycle. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so to compare com to compare something to a year ago. A year ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Lots of yeah. lots of very interesting questions, Santa. Thanks. We always always yeah, enjoy. Great. It's, it's becoming like um. It's like a segment. It's becoming like a an a segment yeah. of the show. Yes. Yeah, which is great. The Santa uh, news so questions hour. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so here's a question I think from English with Heidi. Uh, I think the dialogues. Oh no, this is just. Um, yeah, we, we this is relating to yeah. uh, about the thing about listening. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we answered this one. Yes, yes, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but thanks for the comment anyway, Heidi. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, just a comment here from uh, Nimrod uh, Sal Salgado. 
Watching from the Philippines, to be honest, uh, I am low in English. I can understand, but I try my best. Sorry, every day I practice how to speak English. Well, don't be sorry, uh, Nimrod. You're doing the right thing. Practicing every day. If you practice every day, you will see progress over the over the long term or even the, the medium term. So keep at it. Uh, come back and watch us every week. We're going to try to be here uh, every Tuesday at the same time, 2, 2 p.m. UK time. Um, and um, and yeah, keep practicing every day, and you you will make you will make progress. You're very welcome here. And if you have yeah. any questions um, any about words in anything like like Susanta always has, that's that's what we're here for. So yes, thank you for your comment, and um, yeah, good luck to you. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, okay, number one's got a good question. I think you'll like Tony. Uh, he they say, sir, do you think the oldest language on earth, uh, languages on earth, like Greek, Hebrew, Persian, etc., are in their original form or changing in their vocabulary too with the passage of time? Ah, yes, I am uniquely so, suited to answer this question. Uh, so it's not about what I think, <laughs> I, I know the answer to this. So, for example, to take Greek, um, ancient Greek is not one language, it's several languages. And it changed, we have very detailed records of it changing over time because those Greek people sure wrote down a lot. Uh, so like when you talk about the ancient, ancient Greek, like the Greek of, of Homer or even like Aristotle, uh, there are several different languages. Ionic Greek, uh, Attic Greek, for instance, very common. Uh, that, that changed, um, you know, classic Greek became common Greek, which eventually became medieval Greek, which and modern Greek like is a completely different, I mean, there are a lot of similarities but there are also a lot of differences. Um, and the same is true for Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew is a little bit, is a little bit uh, different just because there was a, a strong effort to recreate the original Hebrew, but there just weren't words for a lot of things. Like there obviously was no word for airplane in ancient Hebrew. So they just kind of took one from an existing language. Uh, same with Persian. You can look at the different eras and you can see how did they spell things differently? How was their alphabet different? How has vocabulary changed? How has vocabulary been influenced by other languages? So yes, absolutely. Even the world's oldest languages, if they're still being spoken, have changed dramatically over time. The only languages that stop changing are languages like uh, Sumer uh, Sumerian cuneiform that stopped existing. And so now it only exists in the archeological record. Uh, any language that's still being used is constantly changing. Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Now, I've got another question here, which is going to be a bit difficult. I'm not sure I completely have the answer. So the Queen's English House official says, is ro ro roticity uh, common in uh, all of the UK, or is it just limited to a few regions? Now, I'm not... Um, a hundred percent sure about this, but I think ro ro roticity is what we've talked about this before several yeah. times. This is to do with the letter R, and it has um, to do with whether you pronounce the letter R at the end of a con of a syllable with a vowel, right? Like car, I pronounce car with the R, mm. and you pronounce car, same. Oh, really? Word. Well, yeah, car. Okay. Yeah, but I guess, well, yeah. But then another. So is it that? Or what about the? What about mother? Is that? Or is it related is to fine. the R as in the the phonetic, the phoneme? The, like, do you pronounce an R as an as an R sound, or do you pronounce it as part of the con the like as a, a do you? We we talk about leaving it off, right? You pronounce the 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 E as a, uh, but the R kind of just doesn't get pronounced. That's non rhotic actually. Mm. Non rhotic means that you do not pronounce the R um, in some contexts. Rhotic yeah. means you always pronounce the R. So actually, this is one of the biggest differences between British English and American or Canadian English is that British English mm. is overwhelmingly non-rhotic. So there's places that they don't pronounce the R as an R, right? It's, it's not that it doesn't change the pronunciation of the word. Um, and in American yeah. or Canadian English, you just always pronounce those R's. But if your question is like, is it all over the UK? So there are places in the US where they don't pronounce their R. Uh, Bostonian accent, a ka, is very common. Um, 
apologize apologies to any Bostonians. I obviously am not good at doing the accent, just trying to illustrate the idea. And then there are places in the UK, especially Cornwall, uh, where they do pronounce the R's, right? Mm. Um, I, I couldn't do it. I can't do a Cornish accent. Sorry. Um, just well, don't have, yeah. have good It's R. similar to Bristol, and it, 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 it's sort of like all the words are all a little bit curly like that. Actually, now, now they talk like a farmer. Bristol and South <laughs> Wales are also uh, rhotic. Yes, mm. uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, so a Bristol, a Bristol accent is also an example of a place where they do pronounce the R's because yes, they've got that like curling to it. Um, mm. Yes, so yeah. rhoticity is a the, really the, interesting the, thing because yeah. it's not uniform. We've got this idea in our minds that British people don't pronounce the R's and American people do, but that's not really true. Each local dialect is either rhotic or non-rhotic on its own. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but the, then the the R phoneme is very. It, it is interesting because we have words like red, where the R, you know, it's r r, you know, and then, but then at the end of a word, car, it's r. So the, it's, it can be r or r, uh, the the R. But I think as a phoneme, well, yeah. it's more r. It's more it's, r. Right? It, I mean, the, the, um, I forget what the word for this is, but that, that's essentially assimilation. But what, like whether mm. you're putting it at the beginning or the end or what's before or after it determines yeah. how you how you stretch the sound. Like it, whether you stretch it at the beginning, do you stretch it at the end, or do you stretch it both? And, and the R is used in a lot of different ways in a lot of different languages. Um, so that's not really what roticity is about no. is about whether sometimes the R gets skipped. Because, yeah, there's nothing different phoneme about the red at the beginning and um, uh, super at the end. Like it's the same sound, same phoneme. Uh, it's just how you meld it into the sound before or after changes. Mm. Yeah. yeah, great. It's a very well, I, complex question, Queen's English. Yeah, now, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and it's, it's I, I feel like, you know, off the top of our heads, uh, it, it's very difficult to kind of give you an answer because it's very technical. It's a very technical question. Well, I mean, um, but in um, this case, the answer is very, very straightforward. Like, no, it is not common all over the UK, but it is common in parts of the UK. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. Great. Now, this comment here from somebody called Hiven Hivenus. Hivenus. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I do apologize. Uh, I've been watching your. I've been watching for a while. Uh, and, and I really like the way you teach. So yes, thank you very much. I'm really glad you're watching and I really hope you're finding these videos and live streams helpful. You'll be glad to know that we will have a lot more content coming in the new year. Um, in January, we are launching a, an, an online course, which is called Inside English, which aims to um, make sense of uh, tenses, make make tense make sense is our tagline. Um, so we're looking and that, that so that's focusing in on all the different tenses, looking at how they work uh, and uh, explaining them in a way that makes sense, because a lot of people think, oh, there's so many uh, irregular verbs and so many. Uh, it's very complicated the way it works and it is different to other languages but there is a logic to it um it, it can be complicated but it's also logical and so we're aiming to sort of highlight that logic in a way that other courses and textbooks don't do um so um so yeah look out for that and once we've once we've launched that we're going to be making a lot more uh videos um certainly in january there'll be at least one video a week on top of these weekly live streams uh maybe more than that um and yeah we're for, throughout january we're, we're aiming to do something every day uh so stay stay tuned for that make sure you're subscribed uh, here on youtube make sure you click the bell so you're um notified when we when we do go live and when we do uh, post new videos but also uh, if you go to the website, you can sign up to the, our mailing list. Uh, so then you'll you'll get notified of, of other things outside of YouTube that we're going to be doing. Um, and also, yes, there's also YouTube memberships that you can also you can already join the English Language Club through uh, through YouTube. And that will uh, currently that gives you access to a few 
little behind the scenes videos that I've made. And we are planning to uh, increase the, the amount of members only content. We do want to have uh, members only um uh, zoom calls because it's great doing having calls like having, doing live streams like this where we can answer your questions but it would be really great if we could actually see you and listen to you um as well so uh, we're really looking forward to meeting some of you face to face in zoom um, and if you want access to that that will be you you'll need to be a member for that uh, and like i said we're also considering uh doing a discord group uh or server so yeah um so stay tuned there's lots more coming um so let's see we've got any other questions we do have several including some from uh our uh, members ah, right. Right. Are we, the, we're running one. low on time do you want are we gonna have to skip ahead or um i think we can probably answer answer these i think real quickly uh number one um, question Right uh, this question. When English speakers say feeling blue, uh, is this about death or departure? Feeling blue just means sad. Uh, so it can be sad for a lot of reasons. You can just be feeling generally sad. You know, there's a lot to feel sad about. You could be sad about specific things, or you could be sad about someone's death. It just means feeling sad, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And then okay. And uh, so. Daniel so just got a bit lost. Here we are, Daniel. Yes. Now Daniel's uh, uh Daniel's one of our new members. Just, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yes, welcome back, yeah. Daniel. So you uh, great great to see you again. Yeah. Uh hello, my question is about the pronunciation of uh, e and u. Uh. Can you pronounce it please? I do not difference. Uh so e is like in the word hello. It's e e hello. And uh, is, I mean, when when I say the sound on its own, it's uh, it's yeah. I'm making it stronger. But normally it's very soft, like in the very word soft. mother, at the end, at the end, mother. Uh, uh, uh. Mm -hmm. um, it's the its technical term is the what is it the mid mid central vowel. So it's which means you know it's very it's very neutral. You're hardly doing anything with your mouth. You're just mm -hmm. you, it's just completely relaxed, yeah. and then you just make that one little sound uh, uh. yes it's often uh, called a half vowel because it's just a very short sound um or i'll mm -hmm. give you an american pronunciation as well or canadian uh the eh like as in tell tell eh right and the uh, like mm -hmm. as in about about because again you just kind of almost barely say it about um mm -hmm. the sound at the beginning yeah like it's got an uh like uh but uh it's just short mm. about you almost it's almost like you're half halfway skipping it yeah so it's a good question those are difficult i will say yeah. uh, a lot of english speakers have struggled with the uh yeah you um sounds in in uh in russian or slavic languages as well uh which are also very similar in how small of a difference they they have so don't don't feel bad uh it's definitely one of these pairs of sounds that can be difficult to to get the hang of depending on what language you're coming from yeah good question and welcome back daniel yeah yeah, yeah thank you for that question daniel yeah welcome back and i look forward to meeting you hopefully in january on one of our zoom calls so yeah, yeah see you then uh so let's see any more questions we also maybe have a comment from kadia talking about the roticity um, say, uh, I am Jamaican and do pronounce the R at the end of words like mother and car if I'm speaking English, but not all the while when I'm speaking Jamaican Creole. And that's a good example. Um, there's often the case where, uh, you know, if you have the kind of the language that's the official language that's spoken um, and is taught in schools, will follow one set of rules. But like when you're just talking amongst yourselves, you're going to follow a different set of rules. So someone from Bristol or Cornwall who maybe has a job on the BBC, uh, when they when they're on the BBC, they'll speak RP and they'll pronounce their uh, they'll they'll use that non rhotic uh, mother ka. Um, but when they're just talking to their friends, they'll say it in whatever whatever accent is more natural to them. That's not super common with rhoticity. Uh, it's something that there's like an official. So in American, uh, you officially pronounce the R, and in British, maybe you officially don't. Uh, but you might. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to speak 
you know, properly officially, you would you say one thing, but you would say something else when you're talking to to just other other people that you know. Yeah. So that's very common with rhoticity. Yeah. 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 But regional accents do th do make things complicated. Um, yes, especially when you go to something like a Creole, uh, like uh, like Jamaican. Yeah. Mm. Very cool. Well, well, thank you for joining us, Kadia. Yeah. And yeah, also, thank you. Uh, Gaspar thank you. has popped in to say hello. Oh. Good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Gaspar says uh, hello, everybody. Gaspar, another one of our, our uh, members. Um, I know Gaspar because I've done uh, classes with him, but uh, uh, we're not doing classes at the moment, but I do hope to see you in January in the Zoom calls as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's coming up to an hour now, so we're going to have to end this soon. Um, so let's see. Um, we've got time. We just, just one more just, comment just, here. I think yeah, this will be the last do, one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, sir, I'm facing lots of spelling mistakes while writing. It's very difficult to overcome, and I'm very much demotivated. And people make fun sometimes, and it's very difficult to explain my feelings. Well, that's very. Um, I'm very sorry to hear that people are making fun of you. That's that's yes. not. That's not good. Um, no, definitely. Like, yeah, spelling is one of the difficult things in English, it along with pronunciation, is. because yes. we don't write the way we pronounce. Um, it, so yeah, it just sort of it just there's no there's no easy easy fix for this. It just takes practice. Um, it does. But and... I, yeah, I guess you can learn the spellings of specific words. Um, it's on, it's very gonna... similar the, the same kind of parts of your brain that are that are uh, not they're related the parts of your brain that remember uh, like how to say a word and what it means and the part of your brain that remembers how it's spelled um, in fact that can really help you work on your vocabulary because spelling is more visual and most of the things that you're learning how to say are also kind of connected to uh, visual uh, we, we often think of uh, images when we think of words uh, so Practicing this can be very, very useful. Um, if you if you really, really struggle with it, do not be down on yourself because there are loads and loads of native English speakers who can't spell to save their lives. So um, yeah. don't feel bad, but it, it can be, it is really, really useful to have good spelling. Um, in the meantime, just, you know, anytime you're writing something, take time to go over it and, and check your spelling with a dictionary or with a spell check or whatever you do. Fortunately, there are a lot of tools nowadays that can help you um, check your spelling and just keep working at it. And don't, don't get discouraged. Don't, don't uh, get feeling blue. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Don't feel blue. And you know, you, you, you say that a lot of native speakers struggle with um, spelling and yeah, I do too. And I, I yes. especially when I was terrible at school, I wasn't a very good student. Um, and um, yeah, I so I use uh, spell spell checker quite a lot. Um, make you know, make sure that you have got your spell checker set to to English if if you are using you know using a, a computer to write. And um, yeah, so the good thing is that that with spelling, uh, you can in, in most types of writing that we need to do nowadays, you you can use a spell checker. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, and there's other tools like Grammarly um, that that also helps. That can also help with um, choosing the right vocabulary, as well as as well as fixing grammar things as well. So um, there are tools that can help with with that. Uh, unlike speaking, which which you know you're, you're more on your own when it comes to speaking to someone face to face. Uh, but anyway, I think um, we will leave it there for this week. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. If you have found this useful, please give us a thumbs up because that really does help other people find us in the future. And like I said, we are going to be producing a lot more uh, content uh, in January, hopefully something every day um, and a lot more uh, videos, which we are already working on. Um, so, yeah, we look forward to seeing you then. Um, and uh, And I hope you have a really good Christmas. We are planning to be here next week, so we should see you then. Um, but uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy this next week if if you if you can, <laughs> and we will see you next week. Um, yeah, uh, one sec. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for watching. We'll see you then. Bye bye.